And we'll get started. So please make sure you sign in if you're looking for any of that. And if you're not, still welcome. And trauma is a huge part of our world. And I talk about it all the time. And tonight, I don't have to talk about it. Um, Terry and I were just talking. I think I met Terry back in about 1976. Um, yeah, that would be about right. Um, <laughs> or somewhere in there, but not in this world or in this form. Back in some crazy days. And then re-met her as we then started going and receiving our masters at the same time. So my little brown Toyota truck, Toyota Tacoma, which is still running with 300,000 miles on it, um, would take the two of us down to Southwestern College. And I still believe our conversations back and forth is what allowed me to say I really earned my master's. As we go deep into different discussions and passions and how do we continue to help people? And how do we hold space in a healthy way? And how do we work with trauma and grief? Terry then worked with me as well at Golden Will Retreat and then started her own. I, I then ran off for a little while and worked at Betty Ford Center um, and Terry ran Golden Willow. And then as I came back, I guess I scared her because then she ran off and worked with the military. But both of us seem to both always end up back in here and I'm always grateful in any form and way that I get to work with Terry. Now she's the director of Via Del Sol here and working really hard to work with all of us and care for our community. So please welcome Terry Barsano. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> um, right away I'll tell you because he forgot to tell everybody this time that I don't speak up. So you have to let me know if you can hear me and I will speak up. Um, Okay. <laughs> All right. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Just do this and I'll speak up again. Okay. Because I do get quiet. So my name is Terry Barzano. I'm fourth generation from northern New Mexico. Been in Taos for quite a while, left for a while, went to work with the military. Uh, I, I believe in Taos and I believe that there's a lot of trauma here. And I'm really grateful to be able to be here. I appreciate the opportunity just to revisit a lot of stuff that I've been working on. Some of the stuff that I try to investigate, I try to look at how it does or doesn't work for people who are in trauma. And so that's really kind of what I'm about. Because I find a lot of times that we get through the symptoms that are bothering us and then we take a breath and we go back to our life. And then a few years later, we're right back in the mess. Thanks. Bless brain. <laughs> brain hard. <laughs> so I wanted to share an interview. There's uh, Edward Tick. He's the author of uh, War in the Soul. He did an interview with uh, Dr. Guy McPherson. And this is a clip out of that. Ed shares the story of a young Marine he met on one of his retreats. This was a Marine who was doing great work during the retreat. However, when the Marine went back home and saw his therapist at the VA, the therapist told him that whatever he had done at the retreat was BS and that you will always have PTSD. People do not heal from this. So just get used to it. Of course, that taught Ed a lot of things. One was the value of proper treatment, and the other was the follow-up that's necessary and the continuing efforts to assist people with going all the way to where it needs to heal, to be able to heal. <clears throat> no. So this is kind of what I feel. I feel like a lot of times we have these wounds that are not just in our mind. 
They're in our body. They're in our emotions. They're in our spirit. They're in our cellular memory. And I think we take care of them, the symptoms, and then we forget. So I just want to recognize this is some of the stuff that I've been playing with, that I've been working with and, and trying to learn from all of those teachers that are out there offering us so much. Um, how to recognize the differences between the emotional brain and the ra rational brain. Like, what even is that? Um, the explicit and implicit memories and how those are relevant to trauma or to healing trauma. Um, the holistic concept, I know I'm in Taos and I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but I just like to touch on that so that we all kind of look at that and remember um, community healing and healing in community. So those are the things that I just want to touch on. And I'm ecstatic when somebody in the room has more information than I do and shares it. Um, so get as loud as you want. Tell me what I get wrong. I want to know. This is really what I want to learn. And so I work on it and I try to present it. And I always find teachers in the room. So holler, yell, stop me, whatever. Uh, this is, you know, this is just a list we could go on forever. I'm sure there's ones I've missed here. Acute trauma, chronic trauma, complex trauma, physical, emotional, psychological trauma, sexual trauma, generational trauma. Any other ones? What did I miss there? I'm sure there's a whole list we could just go on. Self -trauma. I'm sorry? Self-trauma. Self-trauma. Oh, uh, yes. So then the brains. The, uh, the rational brain is only 30% of gray matter. Okay? And it's the part that's constantly thinking about the world, about how to run the show, about how we're going to live in the world. The rational brain really focuses outside of ourselves. That's the thinking, that's the words, that's that part of the brain, like it sounds, it's rational. The emotional brain is the heart of the central nervous system. So this one is a combination of Miss Piggy and Kermit. So it has the brain stem or the hypothalamus, which is the reptilian brain, and then the limbic system. And we hear a lot about that. You know, since Peter Levine started pushing somatic experiencing, you know, we've heard a lot about the limbic system, a lot about uh, fight or flight and the amygdala and the hypothalamus and so for anybody who hasn't heard that, you know, when we're traumatized, that danger component, that danger, Will Robinson, to, oh, is anybody in here old enough to remember danger? I'll get to it. Um, you know, that component gets stuck in when we're traumatized. Excuse me. <clears throat> and that's in the limbic system. That's our mammalian brain. So the combination of those two are the emotional brain. And it tries to create homeostasis in our system. That part of us, wait, I'm gonna get names wrong here. Um, to access it, to get down there and access that part of our brain, uh, Joseph Ledoux, Ledoux uh, neuroscientist, you think I could get the name Ledoux right, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and his colleague said that in order to access this brain, the one that tries to create the homeostasis the, and, and keep us safe, to pick the best options for how do we exist in the world and how do we survive in the world, in order to access it, we have to activate the medial prefrontal cortex, which in layman's terms, it means self-awareness. It means that we activate the part of our brain that notices what's going on inside and recognizes our feelings so that we get to feel them. 
So those, those components, that handles kind of the emotions and all of our physical responses. So this is from uh, Bessel van der Kolk. And I can, I can read it. Generally, the rational brain can override the emotional brain as long as our fears don't hijack us. But the moment that we feel trapped, enraged, or rejected, we're vulnerable to activating old maps and to follow their directions. Change begins when we learn to own our emotional brains. That means learning to observe and tolerate the heartbreaking and gut-wrenching sensations that register misery and humiliation. Only after learning to bear what is going on inside can we start to befriend rather than obliterate the emotions that keep our maps fixed and immutable. So the rational brain will step up and override, and that's like when I see a snake and I freak out, and then I look at it and my rational brain says, oh, it's a rope coiled up. So it'll quiet down that part of me that, you know, grabs my heart that creates that uh, response. You ever felt when you're like, you go cold because your epidural stops, you know, your, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes down, and you get real focused, you know, because something scares you? Then the rational brain can come in and it can override that. But when we're really scared or when we have that traumatized brain that reacts and really freaks us out, the emotional brain will override the cognitive brain. So that rational brain has no power when the emotional brain is activated to the point that it can override it. That's what happens when you're uh, completely out of your mind and fight with somebody you really love. And you start saying stuff that you would never say if you were thinking. You know, stuff that damages our relationships. Um, stuff that hurts people we never want to hurt is because that emotional brain has taken over. And because it's the part of the brain that keeps us alive, it has more power when it's activated to that degree. And it should, yes, ma'am. I just wonder, I've always heard that there's a male-female difference there. Is that true? I like to be really cautious about male-female difference um, because traits that we attribute to the masculine or the feminine, you know, absolutely have research to back them up. But then I try to be careful about who I put that on. You know, so it's different in all of us. You know, just because of our upbringing, because of our, our basic DNA, um, our personality traits, our traumas, you know, it, it really depends. I don't think you can quite lay that over it. So I don't know. physiological fact. There's not that. Yeah, yeah. No, not that I know. If anybody knows more about that. Um, but I, I think... I think we try to pull masculine and feminine so we can understand each other better most of the time. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Anyway, so the um, when the emotional brain is taken over, it can be harder to bring that down if we don't recognize what's happening. So if we're living from that rational uh, component of the brain, if we're living from that thinking part about the outside world, you know, we can get by for a long time, but then when something happens and triggers into a deeper trauma that activates the emotional brain and it overrides it, we don't know what's going on. And it cre it can create a lot of problems. It can, you know, can send an alcoholic right back to the bottle, right? It can, you know, it can send somebody into some of the places Ted and I don't even want to talk about it anymore, you know? Um, because mostly it's because we don't know what's happening. And so I think just getting more information, both for those of us who are providing services, you know, who are trying to hold that space for people who are learning this stuff, who are uh, healing the wounds that they're carrying, 
or they're trying to help their children or their families or their loved ones heal. <laughs> Excuse me. I think the knowledge, I think knowledge is huge. I think that the more we know, the more that we can work with. <laughs> So memories, and this is just, this is a whole lot of words. Um, I looked at that just before I came and I went, whoa, that's a whole lot of words. Um, so implicit memories are really, you know, facts and events. That That's really what they are. And there's a couple of different aspects of that. The declarative, the real facts, you know. This is the important component. Those memories work really well in CBD. CBD. <laughs> CBD. <laughs> I can't get used to the CBD thing. Um, yeah, the cognitive shifts. You know, those are, are facts about what's going on in the world, and we can call those up. But we have to call those up. Um, the episodic, they kind of come up spontaneously. And they have feeling. So those are like the stories. Like everybody in the room, take just a second and think of your earliest memory. My earliest memory is <clears throat> I'm two years old and my parents are building a ranch house out of on the ranch and they, they're doing the floor. And so there's, they're framing it. And I was crawling over those boards, and I thought I was really cool. And that's my earliest memory. <clears throat> the point of all that is that those earliest memories are part of the autobiographical component of our memory system. They're, um, <clears throat> they're kind of a warm memory, whether it's good or bad. It has some kind of emotion, some kind of feeling attached to it. And that's part of, it's part of the explicit memories that are like, it's an external part of us. So nobody talked about like feelings, the inside feelings, except how it was related to something external happening, right? Then when you move to the implicit memories, those are all internal. And they're long-term memories. <clears throat> um, they impact a lot of what we do without us being aware. Because we're not aware of them. They're just there. But the memories that, you know, when you have that uh, deja vu, and you kind of go, oh, wow, that's so familiar. I remember that from somewhere. We have tons of those memories. And... They come up when they're triggered. <clears throat> and that's what happens in trauma as well. That those <clears throat> deeper memories will come up when they're triggered. Those aren't ones that we just pull up when we want them. They're subconscious. <clears throat> um, they're, they're broken down into the two also. The emotional, which is just, it's organized around the emotions. And the procedural, which is our emergency responses, our approach or avoidance, you know, whether it'll be good for us or whether it'll be bad for us. Those things are very deeper. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. And the procedural memories are one of Peter Levine's favorites. <clears throat> so, indeed, the persistent maladaptive procedural and emotional memories form the core mechanism that underlies all traumas, as well as many problematic social and relationship issues. So, these are the ones that get locked in when the amygdala starts screaming and when the hypothalamus locks down. So, just going through something painful, something traumatic, Somebody told me a story one time about walking under an apple tree. <clears throat> you just walk under an apple tree and something hits you in the head. 
You turn and you look around, there's apples on the ground, there's apples in the tree, the apple fell and it hit you in the head. <clears throat> the next time you walk up to the tree, you kind of go, ah, uh, you know, and you pay attention. The next time you walk up, you don't pay attention. But if you walk under the tree and you get hit in the head and you turn around and somebody is threatening you, or somebody <clears throat> jumps down to hurt you, they've deliberately hurt you, then that clamps in tighter. And then you come back around and you avoid the tree, you avoid the street, you avoid the, you know, you, you go further and further away. That's that avoidance kind of component that lives in the implicit memories, whether or not I should go near that tree or not. <clears throat> so then there's also a treatment stew, which also... I just grabbed some things out. Um, we have an enormous amount of options, right? We have a lot of different disciplines, a lot of different practices, a lot of different styles. And most of them, somebody has proven at some point in time that they were beneficial. Some more than others. But they go everywhere from the pharmacological to the mind body. This CBT remind me. C cognitive behavior. behavior. Oh, so that's like working with thoughts that you want to shift. Thoughts or behaviors that you want to shift to move it deeper. <clears throat> um, I know I've missed a ton here. And I apologize to anybody in the room. This, this one I haven't touched on. Just, what is IFS? Uh, internal family systems. So that that works with the components of ourselves that manifest whenever we're in a different situation. Like if I'm uh, having a conversation and you make me uncomfortable, mm -hmm. then a part of myself will come forward and uh, protect me or answer you. And a lot of times we get confused about that being us. Like, I don't understand why I get mad about that. It's no big deal. But it's not all of us. It's not the whole of us. It's part of us. And that's kind of the basis. That's like really simplified down. So one more treatment thought. <clears throat> I hope you guys are going to talk. This is my treatment thought because I buzzed through this pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, healing in community. This goes back to Edward Tick. Um, Edward Tick has been a psychotherapist for probably 40 some years. And uh, he's worked with uh, military with uh, veterans. And he started working with the Vietnam veterans with PTSD. He's written a bunch of books now about it. He's in New York, and he has a program there where he works with vets, working with vets who all have PTSD. And his concept is that in community, we heal. Because we allow each other to feel what we need to feel. And some of the vets told him, I can talk to you all day, and it doesn't make any difference because you haven't been there. So, you know, we, we look at a lot of trauma and PTSD based around the military, we get a lot of research out of there, but it's not just the military. You know, if I've been raped and you haven't, there's only so much I'm going to talk to you about. There's only so much that I feel is safe for me to even feel in the room with you. But if you have, I don't even need to say anything sometimes. <clears throat> you can just sit in that presence. So it's like, an, it's like the energy of the community that's trying to heal the same wounds, the similar wounds. And crossing over sometimes works, you know, like, Somebody who's been in a car wreck and somebody who's been shot, you know, might work. 
And then sometimes it gets more specific. And it depends on your group. But I think it's important for us to consider that we have all of these tools, and the most powerful tool that we have is each other. And I think that's a really important component for us to remember. Um, the community and healing. I, I have to put today, you know, this week, this 10 years, um, here, because one of the reasons I came back from working is because there's a community here that needs to heal. And so often you find that we heal in community, but the community is an organic being. <clears throat> And it needs to heal as well. And I think that here we have an opportunity because we have so many healers. We have an opportunity to bring healing to the community just by being a community. I think also that as um, life has happened in the world since the Industrial Revolution, family, the family unit has slowly separated. Okay, so all the kids went off to the city to get a job, that kind of stuff. And so I think even if historically that component of secrecy or that component of may have come from a very healthy place, from an, a place where community was family, and that healing could happen in that community. And I think that it is, over time, it is diluted. And so now we don't have that specific community of everybody that lives under this household and, and with these ancestors and with to, to be able to use this component in the same way. So what I'm hearing are symptoms. I'm hearing a lot of symptoms and probably not specific to our community. But what we do have here and not all communities are as blessed to have are a lot of healers. And we just need to remember who we are and to bring us back together. The, uh, <clears throat> the component of trauma that fascinates me so much is that held in cellular memory. And in some theories in DNA, and so as, as we move through life and we go through all of these symptoms and we try to struggle to, to support that symptom, we try and help those people who are stuck in uh, addiction. We try to help people who are struggling with self-esteem. We try and help you know people who have been traumatized by being hurt, you know, or who've been to war who would have come home to question what they were doing. All of these things, there's a component that's held so deep that if you go get a massage, you start crying. And you think, well, that was weird. <coughs> it's not weird at all. And that component of awareness is the way to get there to allow ourselves to feel what we feel. And that can't always be safe. And so it's really important that we're walking through treatment, that we're walking through even our own lives at a slow enough pace once in a while to breathe, you know, to breathe into our bodies. You know, I love the sit with someone who really does yoga because I can just vicariously feel my own pain in a space that allows me to feel it. And some of it's held in the implicit memories. So it's all, it's not one thing. It's like <clears throat> I work with someone in my room in the way that I work, in the way that I can be present, in the way that I can hold a space for whatever healing needs to happen in that room, and you do the same thing. You know, whether you're here as a provider, whether you're here as uh, a participant, a consumer, 
uh, a neighbor to somebody interested in what we're doing over here. Um, all of us have this. And when it gets out of control, it causes so much damage. And then we have people who can't go on anymore. And you said it. We have a high rate of suicide. So for me, it, it's just important to remember that all of those components of the brain all the way down through the body are all engaged in trauma. There's just no way to like separate it out. And so when we're hurting, you know, remembering to get supported and then allow ourselves to look at all those aspects. Like, what am I not remembering? What, what did I bury so long ago? And if it doesn't come up, it may not have to come up. Peter Levine works with people in somatic experiencing who never have the memories. You know, we have exposure therapy where you can go through the memory and change what the, the story is. Somatic experiencing, you may never come up with a memory. But you learn to release some of that energy from your body through the somatic experience. But it's important. I think it's really important. And I think it's really important for us to recognize that all of this stuff is not just the micro. It's not just each person. It's the family unit. It's the community. It's we're all these living organisms that deal with trauma. Individual trauma, family trauma, community trauma. And remembering that it's all of those things. You know, maybe we use medication because we're traumatized and, you know, we can't settle down. We can't, you know, we can't be in public. We can't, there's a lot of reasons. Maybe we use medication, but that isn't the end all. You know, then there's more. There's always more. And continuing to support people or continuing to work ourselves on what's the next step. Maybe I get into therapy. And there can still be a next step. Healing is a process. And so I'm doing therapy and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And that's where I stop 10 years down the road. I'm in a ball in the corner crying again because something on the TV brought my trauma back to my life. Because I never got to that place where I could actually feel the pain. We get disconnected from our own soul. In trauma, we can get disconnected from that part of us that lives in all of us that, that connects to other people. I think that we disconnect from our belief systems, our faiths, our trust. I think trust is a huge part of the spiritual trauma. We lose trust. And, and whether that be in church or whether that be in uh, our best friend. We start losing trust and then we can't connect to something bigger than ourselves and we become very small in a big world. That we we walk through the world without uh, allowing our energy to our spirit to touch other people. I think we become very small. Um, and scared and lonely. And I think the spiritual component, whatever that is for everybody in the room, is the, the core part, thank you, bring your back on, um, is, to, is to be connected. And I think that that's our spiritual being. I think that's, and when trauma comes in and we're going 100 miles an hour trying to survive, because this part of our brain says that's what you gotta do, is survive. And then we're doing all kinds of crazy things that are killing us. <laughs> we're, you know, I think that reconnecting to our own sense of something bigger than us, something 
that is as beautiful as the Rio Grande River, you know? Something that's as beautiful as the aspens that are about to turn and the sound that they make. Do you ever notice there is no place else you can hear that sound? You hear the sound of aspen leaves in the wind. It is the only place you hear that sound. And we lose track of that. And we walk through the world in this funnel, which is what trauma does. Brings us down. If a tiger comes in the room, I need all my focus and all my vital organs online. And everything else just doesn't need to be online. I don't need to be hungry. I don't need to be... My reproductive system doesn't need to be activated. My epidural... I don't need any of those going on. I need that tight focus. And when we're traumatized and the amygdala locks it in and is easily triggered, it keeps me in that tiny little focus and I forget about all the beauty in the world. I have, of course, I have. Um, let me read to you. If I can figure out how to do this. Because I don't have a kid here to do it for me. <laughs> um, so John Muir was an environmentalist. He was a mountain man back in the late 1800s. Okay, Yosemite, that area, he like did things people shouldn't do. But I stole this one out of his book just the other day. It says, you're going to a strange journey this time, my friend. I don't envy you. You'll have a hard time keeping your heart light and your, and simple in the midst of this crowd of madmen. Instead of the music of the wind among the spruce tops and the tinkling of the waterfalls, your ears will be filled with the oaths and groans of these poor, deluded, self-burdened people. Keep close to nature's heart yourself and break clear away once in a while and climb a mountain or spend a week in the woods. Wash your spirit clean from the earth stains of this sordid, gold-seeking crowd in God's pure air. It will help you in your efforts to bring to these people something better than gold. Don't lose your freedom and your love of the earth as God made it. So I wrote that down because I want to remember that that gold that you bring back to these people. You know, it sounds like he's saying horrible things about people. <laughs> But he says, go to the mountains, go connect to your spirit, and bring that gold back to the people. 